Good evening, everybody. I'm super excited because today on the show we have Jim Challenger. Hi, Jim. Nice to have you on the show. Hey, nice to be here. We've been talking about this for a long time, so it finally happening. Nice. So to everybody who does not know Jim, Jim has done something really amazing for the baking community. And let me just put on this one video, which perfectly describes what you're doing. <laughs> it's time to take your bread baking to the highest level. Introducing the Challenger Bread Pan, the world's best pan for baking artisan bread. With the Challenger Bread Pan, you can bake the perfect loaf of artisan bread each and every time. Because it's the only pan designed for it. Wow, Jim. Seriously, nice video. <laughs> ah, thank you. You got a, a really good videographer. <laughs> I really need to get myself this voice effect of, you know, this um, amazing voice. I don't have it quite yet, I guess. <laughs> wait, so wait, so that voice is a guy, a, a newscaster kind of originally from Chicago who makes like documentary. He's like known as The Voice. And we met him at a party and I reached out to him. I said, would you do a voiceover for us? And he said, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it sounds like from the BBC documentation or something like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's unbelievable, that guy's voice. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, Jim, so what's your story? How did you come up with making this amazing bread pan? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, I guess I've told it. It's, I was just a home baker, right? So I was just a home baker, probably like, well, I know like you and like lots of people, probably everybody online here. Um, and I was just... Kind of frustrated i'd gone through the little tiny lodge pan i tried the look crusade because you know that's what i had in my house and it was really deep and there was just nothing out there and i think i ended up in the end probably for the last year or two baking on a baking steel and trying to steam a home oven and home ovens aren't designed for steam and i guess i just had this idea of a pan similar to the lodge but made for bread and and i stumbled across um, this woman who turns out lives a couple hours north of me, she makes copper cookware in her garage the old fashioned way. And she had also designed um, an old fashioned looking skillet. And I looked at her website after talking to her about her cookware and I saw the skillet. I'm like, how did you do that? Like, I knew nothing about cast iron. I wasn't thinking I had a business. Um, and she, we talked about it for a long time. She ended up hooking me up with her product designer. Um, also who lives a couple hours north of me in the foundry, which is about five hours north of me. Um, and we're kind of off to the races. I just was, but I wasn't really making a pan. I wasn't starting a business. I was making a pan because I wanted something better to bake in. Um, and I made 10 of them. I gave six away to some friends and I kept four because I've always been sort of a community baker. So I, I always needed four pans at once. Um, and Instagram kind of just went crazy for it. Um, okay. And so it just, it was insane, really. At first, my wife and I thought we could still do it. I was going to season them in a pizza oven in my backyard. But all of a sudden, the 25 emails went to 250 emails, went to 500 emails. Um, and we just started saying, we got to sort of have a business. So <laughs> I stumbled into being an entrepreneur. Um, and it's fun. It's a ton of work. But um, giving back to this community that gave me so much, it's been the best thing really I've ever done in my life, I think. Okay, awesome. And what do you think makes this bread pan so great in comparison to other equipment? Um, I guess a, f a few things. Like I said, with the when you bake on like a pizza stone or a baking steel, you know, it, you got to put steam in a home oven. Um, and home ovens are really designed to vent steam. That the whole idea is they have vents, and so anytime you put steam in, it's trying to suck it out of there. Um, and so we designed True, yeah. a pan with a really good seal. Um, so, so that was it in, in, well, I guess we started out with a bigger pan. So first it was to shape it like a loaf of bread or like a batard and to hold batards and bulls really easily. Um, and then it had to have great steam. It had to be the right thickness, um, so that, that it could hold onto the heat that you preheated the pan, or even as you put a cold loaf of dough on the, in the pan, you don't want that dough to like all of a sudden drop the temperature of the pan too much. So we worked on the thickness of the pan. Um, we worked on the shape of the cover and then finding the the, the handles on the cover um, to take it off mid-bake. So the prototype didn't have those handles and the prototype was really hard to use. Um, okay. and I had so many people who had emailed me about the pan, like I wanted to go forward with it and just make them. And this guy, Trevor Wilson, anybody here remembers Trevor Wilson? Oh, He's yes. On Instagram all the time. 
he was the one who really helped me design the pan, the second iteration more than the first. And he said, Jim, look, he goes, it takes a long time to become a sourdough baker. He goes, it takes a long time to make the right pan. He goes, don't sell this one. Let's go back to the drawing board. So he really, <laughs> the two of us went back to the drawing board, sending little sketches back and forth. Um, and that's the pan we have today. And that's it, amazing. It, it's amazing. It is amazing. And Thank you. So just to understand cast iron, what does it exactly mean? Is it just made out of iron, the material, or is there other material involved? It's iron and a few other, I don't know, I guess I'd call them sort of trace elements. It's mostly iron in, in some other elements. I don't know. I guess the word cast must because it's cast. It's not like if you think of the word forge, most people think of forging like you'd forge um, mm -hmm. a, a, a sword or something, but you have to pound on it. There's no pounding. Basically, cast iron is the iron, the, the liquid iron is poured into a mold. And so that's okay. a cast. So the mold, it's called a tooling. So you build this mold, the shape of, we built the mold, the shape of a pan, and the, the molten iron is then poured in. Um, and then um, the two pieces are then basically knocked out of the mold. Um, oh, okay. And, then and out of which material is this mold done? I mean, it needs to be able to withstand the high heat of the iron, right? Yeah, I think. I want to say sand, but it's not quite sand, but it's something like sand. Okay. Um, so I guess that's also a very different sand. Oh, uh, okay. Why a lot of people like some of the really old cast iron, I guess the sand was different back then, but it was more dangerous for the workers. So the sand okay. has changed, which meant cast iron has changed a little bit than what it was 100 or 200 years ago. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, it just yeah knocked out of the mold. Um, and because of those top handles that we put on, um, they're kind of difficult to mold, so you have to put these blocks underneath them. So they got to knock the blocks off, and then they got to hand hand grind the pans a little bit to kind of smooth out underneath the handles. Okay, awesome. It's, it's a pretty complex hand process, but it's pretty cool. I have a question for you. So I, yeah. I also have a Challenger bread pan, and I've been baking with it recently. And what I notice is the following. Let me just put on the clip right here. So what I pretty much did is um, on the left-hand side, I was baking it at a hotter temperature. And yep. on the right-hand side, I was baking it at a lower temperature. And I would be curious to know what your thoughts are on how to best use the bread pan. Um, boy, you know, it's a good question. I actually just kind of did that experiment, but only one time recently. I haven't done it for a while. Um, so I think the kind of the jury's out. I did some reading on it and it seems that you could almost bake bread at any temperature, and it kind of depends what you're looking for. Um, okay. so I read on one website that if you bake it lower and slower, you'll get a thinner crust. And so I haven't experimented with that. I mean, anybody anybody online here probably knows the, the world of learning to bake bread is about experiments. And I probably have a list about this long of experiments I want to do. So it's on as okay. an experiment. So what did you, what did you decide? So I, like I said, I only did it once recently. And yeah, I, I mean, if you just look at your Instagram channel, those are just some of the amazing breads that Jim is baking. I mean, seriously, every bread that Jim is doing looks like that. And I wish my breads would look like that. So I'm wondering, yeah, to get a bread like this, what what do you do? Which, which temperature are you opting for? Which technique are you opting so for? That, that bread is probably, I preheat the pan to 500. I think that's 260 Celsius. I knew uh, this was going to come, so I prepared a small <laughs> table. 260 Celsius, yes. <laughs> OK. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I turn my pan. To, the minute I load my, my bread, I turn it down to 500, or I turn it down to 425 Fahrenheit. So yeah, right about 216, 220. Wow, OK, so that's relatively low. Yep. Um, mm -hmm. so, so, but the pan stays hot, and I'd like to actually do an experiment with a remote thermometer that I have for barbecue to see how long the pan stays hot if I put it under the loaf of bread. But because of the thick cast iron, it stays hot long enough. Um, and so I've just played with that second temperature a lot and kind of like the way my loaves come out. Um, but I'm really curious about that comment that said, lower temperatures will give you thinner crust. I've asked a lot of bakers who say that, boy, I got a thin crust. I'm like, well, what did you do different? No one seemed to really know. Um, I think that's kind of the fun thing about sourdough is no, no one really knows. <laughs> there, there's, yeah. there's lots of people, but the, <laughs> the whole world of sourdough, I think, is advancing right now 
astronomically. And so, yes. yeah, no one knows all these answers. It's exactly. up for all of us. Yeah, and I, I noticed in the video that I just sh that I've just shown that for me the sweet spot was at around 450 degrees Fahrenheit. If I would bake yeah. at a high a hotter temperature, then I wouldn't get that nice oven spring. It seems that the crust has been forming too quickly inside of the bread pan. Uh -huh. and, and and at what point do you take the cover off? Uh, after around 25 minutes, I take the cover off. Okay. Yeah. So and I've heard you can experiment with that. I've been doing 20. I've tried a couple times 25 minutes. It's, okay. It's, and it's so hard to design experiments to know whether it's Baker error or or is it science? It's so true. <laughs> yes. In my case, it's Baker error. Like I don't. If I shape two loaves, they're not shaped the same because I don't know what I'm doing. So okay. I, I don't know. It, it's hard to know sometimes. Yeah, and I've seen you also loading some ice cubes in your bread pan from yeah. time to time. Have you? What is the effect on that? Of that? Um, I seem to have discovered early on. Maybe when I first, I guess it must have been when I first designed the prototype of the pan. I don't know why. I must have seen somebody else post about adding some steam. So you can add too much steam. You have to sort of, but but depending on the hydration of your loaf, I cook a lot of lower hydration breads. Um, mm -hmm. I think they can use that extra little pop of steam that you can get from an ice cube. I've tried okay. spraying, um, and, and some people love the spraying. For me, the spraying doesn't work so well, or I don't do it. The, the right way or something. Um, but the okay. ice cubes, a little extra steam from the ice cubes have always helped my loaves. Okay. Yeah, I would be curious because maybe this is also lowering the temperature inside of the Dutch but, oven a little bit, right? That could also be one of yeah, the Yeah, I think I saw that in a, something you sent me. And so there it goes back to, I really should put my barbecue up. So I have one of those remote thermometers that I could probably just stick under my loaf of bread and track the temperature. Um, yeah. Done. But I haven't done it yet. I'd like to do it. I'd like to do it. Yeah, some of the viewers also pointed out because I recently did an experiment where I was just showing this so that too high temperature might not get you that oven spring and that amazing bunny shape that you are always nailing on every bread that you're making. Not always. <laughs> not always. <laughs> uh, and the other tip that one person was saying was maybe to just uh, preheat the lower part of the Dutch oven and not the upper part. Just so yeah. the idea is pretty much that the, the dough is shielded a little bit from the high heat, and then you get all the ex expansion from the bottom. No crust forms. Your bread really opens up. And yeah, that's also something I want to try. I'll keep you posted on the results. Yes, I haven't seen that. I know those guys who wrote Modernist Bread, that five-volume bread thing, yeah. so they, did a, they did some tests with a totally cold Dutch oven. And, and you still get a fairly decent loaf, but their conclusion was you wanted a hot Dutch oven, but I don't think they ever did half and half. So they definitely did one or the other, but not half. And I've never tried only the base. Okay. My, my, my gut thinks you're gonna need heat on top because it's gonna take, if it's you only got 20 minutes left in your bake, the hot, the, the top's not gonna get very, um, oh no, you're gonna take the top off. Oh, so the top would be cold during the first 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. ah, I'll, I'll wait for your experiment. It sounds interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted to show you the next thing, how I typically uh, load the bread in my bread pan. And I wanted to ask you what you think about it, because I know that you're doing it a little bit different. Let ah, me just show you. Okay. <laughs> so I think what you do is you just flip over the banners and directly I do. into the bread pan, right? Yep. For me, what I like to do is I just like to take the bottom part and place it directly on <clears throat> the banneton, and then I just flip the whole thing over because I feel that that's a little more gentle yeah. on the dough. Yeah, I could see it. I feel like the dough doesn't really plop out very much, but it's kind of interesting. I never thought about that. So. Is it is it hard to do considering that it's hot and somewhat heavy or no? Something just to get the, used to? Well, the only fail I then did is uh, somebody <laughs> sent me um, not a linen uh, for a banneton something. It was not made out of out of cotton. It was made out of um, out of plastic. And then I did exactly the same thing, and then just completely melted and was stuck to the bread pan. So oh. in that case, it might not be such a good idea. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, they do make plastic bannetons, definitely not. So I haven't, <laughs> it's an interesting thing though, because it, it seems like it would come out e more evenly, right? Because I kind of, yeah, I kind of roll mine out. And so it seems like if you're just flipping yours over, it might just kind of plop down nicely. Yeah. I might try it. And then, then I have another question, and that is, I mean, for instance, you, I see you baking so many breads at the same time. Let me just put on this video also real quick here. <laughs> it's a lot of bread. It's a lot of bread. You've baked yeah. all of them in your Challenger bread pans at home. Hey, we do well. Since we, we, I used to bake them all in a Challenger bread pan, my wife and I built a house, God, almost two years ago now. We moved in in August of 2019. Um, and so I put in a small commercial deck oven because my whole goal, I mean, it, it's, I kind of started out baking just for my family and stuff, but then it pretty quickly moved into sharing with friends and then sharing with neighbors. And it's kind of blossomed into really sharing with the community. So we give away about 50 loaves a week to friends and neighbors who just, they come by our house and they can pick them up anytime. Um, so it's just always been a part of me. So now it's it's four loaves, four loaves in Challenger bread pans, two in each oven, and then 12 loaves in the, in the deck oven. Okay, and do you notice a difference in comparison to your deck oven? You know, I don't. Uh, okay. So I mean, I, then you designed the perfect bread pan, I guess, right? So, so, I, so I haven't done, so we'll so go back to experiments because I don't shape the same every time. It's sometimes hard to say, but I would say I could put, I could put my loaves in the midst. I could put Challenger bread pan loaves in the midst of the 12 loaves and no one could pick them up ever. They, okay. they all look different, but they look different because of baker air. They would, you could never say this looks worse or better than a deck oven. They're the same. So yeah, they, it was designed. I think that's the, the heat retention um, and the, the ability to hold steam, which is just so critical for bread. Okay, awesome. And when you're saying that you're uh, doing a community bake, is that that you give the bread free of charge to all your neighbors or do you charge a little bit just for the electricity, flour and everything? No, it's just, it's free. It's just, it's kind of like, Our, wow. our, our, our service that we do, it, it's grown a lot more than we ever thought. Um, but still, you know, you think about it, flour is fairly inexpensive. You do have the electricity and stuff, but it's not so bad. And somehow doing service for people is what we all should be doing in our life in some way, shape and form. And so somehow the bread thing has just been our service. Um, oh, that's amazing. But though I will say, <laughs> we, we, sometimes, we sometimes make a Guinness beer cheddar bread And I said to my wife, and she goes, we should just bake that for everybody. I'm like, well, then it gets expensive. And now we're paying for beer and we're paying for all the cheese. And so all of a sudden it's not really just, I mean, I buy flour and 50 pound bags of flour, which is whatever yeah. that is, 15, 16 kilos. Um, and so it's fairly inexpensive, but beer and cheese would be more expensive. But it's mostly, it's mostly flour and water that we give away. Look, we got somebody here who's also also has a great YouTube channel, Bake with Jack. Everybody, yeah. you should check it out as well. Yeah, <laughs> he hey, can't Jack. Wait to try his own pen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, oh yeah, he was. I think he was building a new kitchen or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He was building I a new kitchen. I can't wait to see the pan too. Yeah, <laughs> he just posted about his kitchen, didn't he? I don't know how to comment to him, but he did just post about his kitchen. Yeah, I think he's almost done with his studio. I asked, asked yeah. him, hey, Jack, let's do an interview as well at some point. He's currently busy yeah. setting it up. And uh, I think then also there's going to be great new content coming from him. So he's also one of the guys who taught me so much about uh, bread making. So he's yeah, an awesome kudos. baker. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> It'd be good to get him back online. I have a question because so I thought, okay, I'm currently doing all those experiments and they, of course, have to lead to something. And so my plan in a couple of weeks after I'm done with some ex experiments, I still have to do a couple of them until I nailed the perfect bread. And then yeah. I just want to film the reactions of a couple of potential customers who taste my bread just to see what uh, they think of it. Okay. How is that feeling for you? Because you have so many people trying your bread. Do you have people yeah. saying, wow, this is the best bread I ever tasted in my life? Or do you also have some saying, this is a mediocre bread. It's, it's okay-ish. So 
The amazing thing is, I have two ways to answer that. One is everybody said it's the most amazing bread that we've ever done. And so my wife and I have taken a two week hiatus and people are dying because they're so, they've been so used to eating fresh baked bread that they don't want to go back to the store. But on the same time, I've changed my bake. I put in some whole wheat, I put in some rye, I put in some, you know, sort of gr other grains in order to change the flavor. Not one person ever notices. Okay. Just, <laughs> so, so yes, they like the bread, but, but maybe you have to be a bread geek to really taste the flavor differences. And even for me, sometimes I'll say, God, what am I really tasting? So they're not noticing that, but I know it's more nutritious and it's more fun to experiment anyway, but, um, they do all love the bread. I don't think they've ever experienced real bread. Okay. So, um, yeah. You, you mean that crispy crust paired with the perfect crumb? This is something they never experienced before. Yeah, they, they just don't know what it is. And and the funny thing, hopefully, maybe some of them are on here listening. You know, a lot of them take the bread in plastic because I slice it up for them. But to me, I can't even eat bread in plastic because it completely changes. You know, the texture changes, the crispy crust goes away. And so it's kind of funny, but I, so I, I, I cajole people every once in a while, don't forget to try a bread, you know, where I give it to them a whole loaf instead of sliced up in plastic because yeah, that, that's when you really get the, the reason I'm a baker is those fresh baked, okay. crispy, crispy, crusty loaves. Hmm. Maybe one thing that I was considering. So the, for my first experiment, I just wanted to hand some of the bread to some random people and ask them to try it. Yeah, and then yeah. I wanted to start maybe an on-demand delivery service for bread where I wouldn't finish baking the bread, maybe just for 25 minutes or so. Uh -huh. And then I would wrap it in plastic and then they would need to finish the last part of the bake in their home oven because only then they can experience exactly the perfect bread that you just described with the crispy crust. That's a great idea. The par bake, right? They have, there's a name for that in the, in the bakery world, par baking bread. I never thought about that as a home sort of what we community kind of baker. That's totally cool. I think it's a great idea. Because in Germany, for instance, we love to eat, we call this Sonntagsbrötchen, Sunday bread rolls. So I would say in our culture, it's free to eat uh, some bread rolls on Sunday mornings or so. Yeah. yeah. And the problem with that is to achieve that, what you have to do is you have to get up really, really early on Sunday mornings to get fresh bread rolls. And ah, so, yeah. So a great trick is to make them a day before, but not finish the bake. You just pretty much bake it half time. And then the next morning on Sunday, all you do is you heat your oven and you finish the bake pretty much. So you have fresh bread rolls the next morning. Wow, yeah. I love that idea. Maybe an idea. I might have to try it myself and see what you <laughs> think because like I said, they're missing, they're missing that, that fr fresh bread right out of the, even when it's hot, when the crust, I mean, the crumb hasn't quite finished cooking, it still tastes great. Yeah. Play out there with butter, it's the best. On that notice, so C. Fazio from Chicago has a question. Do you use an automatic slicer? Wait a second before you answer that because I need to show one amazing footage from Jim and that is Jim. <laughs> you how do you slice a bread like that what's what's your secret um <laughs> fast and you need a sharp knife and a good thin crust so you gotta hope that you have a good thin crust it doesn't always go through the bottom i still think my bottoms could get thinner i don't know why the bottom crust seems sometimes too thick but yeah you just a quick a quick sawing action so no pressure just sawing pretty much yeah pretty much yeah i don't think a lot of pressure and i think I had to think about what I'm doing. No, I don't think a lot of pressure. I think it's mostly sawing. Maybe just a little okay. pressure down, um, and then it. And you, you can even tell how good your crumb is as you go through it. I I can almost tell not quite what it's going to look like, but you can feel density in your crumb just from the knife. And when you make a bread like this, and you slice it open, and you have the perfect crumb in front of you, do you manage to also make a slice out of this, this which looks exactly as good as sort of the initial slice after you wrap it open? Um, I'm not sure your question. What so you if, if I now take a slice from this bread, then, yeah. I, uh, then the first slice that I take, I don't know, I just push the bread down too much. It, It doesn't have the same, because I pushed the, the crumb down too much, it doesn't have the same uh, look of it. 
sort of afterwards after it took a slice. Yeah, yeah, it does. It is harder to the yeah, the very first one. You are right that the, the the first slice or any slices thereafter really do push down the bread a little bit. Um, okay, I I do have an automatic slicer for my my buddy here in Chicago. Um, I can't say it works great. I've had it for a few years, um, and and I think recently I kind of discovered if if the bread is too soft, it would just sort of bunch up and so it's kind of horrible but i found if i if i lead the bread out of the out of the blade it actually slices pretty well uh, okay and, and and so you don't you don't really need it for a single loaf of bread like for home or whatever but when we're slicing up most of the 16 loaves it helps a lot okay yeah i definitely need to upgrade my bread slicing skills i guess yeah <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's just, it's like anything else, right? Practice. Practice, Practice. makes progress. That was somebody oh. on Instagram said it once, and that is just stuck in my head forever. It doesn't, do you know, it doesn't make perfection, it makes progress. Do you notice a difference with your automatic uh, bread slicer in comparison if you slice it manually? Is it any different or does it yield the same um, results? I think it's pretty much the same. It's probably. I have, I've almost never tried to slice an entire loaf nice even slices i bet i bet it would be harder kind of like what you were saying that it would start compressing the crumb a little bit on some of those loaves so i bet slicing a whole loaf would be better okay but and pretty close there was a great question uh from brian and i just want to put that on the screen how long do you wait before cutting your instagram loaves um I usually wait, I like to wait two hours. I can't say that I'm always really good at that. It sort of depends. So I, I bake them in the morning and, and usually around 6 a.m. And so then by seven, so then I'd eat around eight or something, eight or nine, and it's okay. But sometimes I'm hungry, so then I eat them a little warmer. It tastes good a little warmer, but it's not perfect. I think two hours is kind of the good magic number for me. And to everybody who has not followed Jim yet on Instagram, so that's his account, Jim Chell on Instagram. Please check that out as well. Amazing bread footage. It really makes me so hungry whenever I see your perfect bread. <laughs> ah, thank you. Thank you. It awesome. It doesn't always look like that. Um, okay. So, yeah, another question I had, and that was, I was curious because also now just on the Instagram channel, we saw that you have been making some buns here, for instance, in your bread pan. What yeah. has been the coolest thing you have seen somebody baking inside of your bread pan before? Um, boy, I think the best thing, I don't know what you call it in Germany here. Actually, I didn't really know because I don't make a lot of pie. Someone made something called a slab pie, a blueberry slab pie in the 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 bottom of the challenge i have to say it was look mine would never look i could have tried that recipe a hundred times it would never look as good at first it was mouth-wateringly good um amazing we use the pan all the time i mean someone someone made a, a rack of lamb in it the other day just yesterday i think someone posted in it um so yeah the the, the base especially you can turn the the cover over and use it as a dutch oven which i don't do as often i do like to cook but the the base we probably use it couple times a day is just a skillet it's just a big skillet yeah i saw that you also made a roast chicken in it some yeah at some point right yeah yeah i always roast my chicken in it love roast chicken awesome um one thing that i see on some of your loaves is that you do seem to get a lot of blisters on them is that always the case what's the secret in your opinion to get blisters wow this <laughs> this <laughs> blisters honestly the, the blisters yeah, are what made me Instagram famous. So those blisters <laughs> appeared on my loaf the very first bake when I made a prototype of my pan. I'd never had a <laughs> blister before. And and none of the, I'm, if, if you remember, I made 10 pans. I sent out six. None of those six people could get the blisters. Every single one of my loaves, and it's not as much anymore today, every single of my loaves was blistery out of my prototype of the pan. Um, I don't know the answer. Um, and okay. I've seen lots of people try to experiment to get the blisters, but I think it had something to do with the steam. I don't put a lot of um, flour in my banneton, so I use a, a linen line banneton, which I think helps. So I don't have to really flour my loaf almost at all. Um, and so I think that helps. And then when I when I score it, some people to get a nicer score, a fancy score, they'll 
So rub some flour in it. So I don't do any of that. I do think a, a naked loaf is more likely to be blistery like that. So yeah, yeah no flour. This just adds this another amazing uh, level of crispness, I think, to the bread. Yeah, right? that it looks so good, doesn't it? All the different colors. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I know that some people are saying, okay, traditionally blisters have been a bad sign on for some breads, right? Yeah. yeah. But personally, I think this just adds amazing texture to the bread. Yeah, me too. The crispness of the crust, the blisters, and then this nice, uh, chewy, open crumb. It's just a perfect play of different consistencies. Right, right. So, yeah, so I love the blisters too, but you're right. So, historically, blisters have been a bad thing for bread. Uh, yeah. So Bread is so much a personal thing. It, it just, you, you got to bake what you like, right? It's so, yeah. even how dark you want your crust or how light you want your crust, you know, every baker is different. Every person who eats a piece of bread is different. Um, that's what makes it so fun. I got some other amazing footage from you. And that is, in my opinion, this is probably the most emotional moment for every hobby baker. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts on it. Let me put the video live. Okay. So the moment you open up your Dutch oven or you change your bread case and you see either you failed or yeah. you made the problem. <laughs> it, it's true. <laughs> Be, being a perfectionist, I see a lot more failures than I do what I'm hoping for, but they get better every day or you, you, you sort of get in good spurts and you're thinking, boy, my bread's getting good. And then you kind of <laughs> fall off for a little while. But yes, that, that, that moment of taking the cover off is one of the best moments of baking, for sure, 100%. <laughs> and what's your success rate? Is it 90%, 95%, 80%? What would you say? Um, what nice is that? I bet it's 50 to 75. Yeah. I feel like I still don't really score very well. I'm still trying to get that that motion. So sometimes, you know, you, you need a really good score to get the really good ear. And I don't know what it is. Sometimes I can do it and sometimes I can. I haven't. I watch people can go slowly without catching their bread. And I don't really do that yet. Um, so I think some of it is the consistency of the dough, which I'm not consistent with. And some of it is my knife skills, my 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 lamb skills. But, but I mean, if, if I look at your breads uh, here, I got another picture, which I'm uploading right now. <laughs> um, this here, you nailed the ear on all of them. They just look amazing. They do. And, and there you go. So so probably a, a, a quarter of those loaves were in the Challenger bread pan and a quarter of those loaves were in a small deck oven and they look the <laughs> same. Have the people ever commented on such things as the ear or the blisters, or is this something only baking nerds talk about? The people I give bread to have never said a word. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, they just like to eat the bread. They love to eat the bread, actually. But no, they don't notice the blisters, the coloring, the, the, the ear. Um, I mean, sometimes, if you really think about it, a really monster ear, which is, you think as a bread baker, yes, I did something good. <laughs> it doesn't really make a great sandwich bread, right? Now you got this big thing out there, which I'd probably True. like because it's really nice and crispy, but I don't know if everybody else really likes it. Yeah, so when I'm meeting friends, I'm bringing my bread and I'm thinking, wow, this is the best bread I've ever made. And everybody just eats it. Mm, yeah, it's good. It's good, right? <laughs> it's good. That's, that's, exactly what, that's exactly what I think. They all like it, right? It's still, it's, they know it's better than what they've ever eaten before, but they don't know anything else. I mean, it, even when I started baking, I've still never eaten a loaf from a fabulous baker. Well, foolproof baking, Kristen lives near me. So the first time I ate her bread was about two years ago at a Chicago bread club meeting. So I do think her bread was better than any bread I've ever eaten. Um, but one day I want to make it to San Francisco and go to, you know, Tartine and eat some oh, of yes. Robertson's bread just to know what, so I, you know, I just sort of started on this thing. I didn't know what great bread tasted like or whatever. It just, I don't know what it is that drew me into the craft, but, but, but it's just a fun craft. So I've seen you also making a lot of dough at the same time. And let me put on one video here, which I took from your Instagram channel. Okay.
huge arms, and he sits there and manhandles, I don't know how many kilos of, of dough. Um, I think I was pretending that was him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it was 80% hydration, but that dough it, looked so smooth, and it didn't really stick that much to your hands. Yeah, yeah. Um, probably not 80. I don't remember what it was. I don't do a lot of 80s. I'm still not very good with a, a really soft dough. Okay. I'm better with a I'm better with a little bit stiffer dough still. I think you wrote mostly at 75 or 76 percent overall final hydration that yeah. you're doing, right? Yeah, I think right now I'd gone up to 80 um, after talking with foolproof baking a little bit. Um, and I just wasn't hundred I think I was happy with it, but I wasn't hundred percent. Then I went to 78. And I'm at 76, and I feel this is probably 76. Um, yeah. Seems to be a good spot for me right now. Um, and I'd like to inch up again just to kind of see the changes. But it's the 76, 75. Um, like I said, it was, it was the one thing I did when I did my sort of keep it simple sourdough. I think when you're a beginning baker, start with start with not a lot of water in your bread. I mean, the, the more water, it just it makes everything harder from – from from mixing to shaping to scoring to baking, um, it just I totally agree. All the all you know, all the bakers you see, they convince you just to keep adding water. To, don't do it. <laughs> that, that'd be my best <laughs> advice for starting out: is don't add a lot of water. Like I tried it for years. It just it makes everything hard. Why do it? This bread tastes great. I was making bread at at, at seventy percent or sixty seven percent. It tastes fantastic. You know, and you, 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 as you make more bread, you'll, you, you may find you like 75 or 80 percent better because it's softer. But all, mm -hmm. every bread on the scale tastes great. It, it just, yeah, tastes, they all taste great. There's no, there's no bread that's better than than another. They just, they're different. And if I now look at this bread, then your crumb looks somewhat airy, right? Not too wild, but it's, I would yeah. say, it's more of an even crumb. How, how do you get to a crumb like this? Practice. <laughs> Practice. Okay. <laughs> I haven't quite figured it out yet. I, I haven't really gone for some of those. Like, I almost don't really want a wild crumb. I'd like as a baker to know I could make a really wild crumb. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly I would just want to, I'd like to, my, my goal is always just to learn how to control it. So if, if, okay. if I wanted to make a wild crumb or, or so I, I do pat my loaf a little bit because I think, especially when I give away loaves to people, they don't really want a wild crumb. Even my, my wife and kids will sometimes look at it like, you know, you can't, like, you can't put butter on this loaf. You know, I may like it, but they're not going to like, so this is not so bad, right? There, you know, butter may, may, may sneak in a little bit of some of those holes, but mostly it's not going to ooze out all over your plate. True, yes, especially with olive oil, for instance, that's a yeah. little frustrating sometimes. <laughs> so, so it's the the big holes is more for us bakers, I think, than than eaters. Even though I, I'll I'll take them any day. And a bread like this is it um, standalone bread that you make, or is this part of a batch of let's say five or six, the you, uh, five or six breads that you're making at the same usually time? Usually, my when I make bigger batches, I cannot get as good of a crumb. Um, oh, okay. I think there's mm -hmm. more handy. So most of the loaves I would post, specifically I'll say every once in a while, this is from a big batch, if I get happy with doing well in a big batch. But when you think about a big batch of dough, there's just a lot more handling that has to go on. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think it's a lot harder. So I'm, as much as I'm always impressed with professional bakers, professional bakers, the other thing that's so impressive about them is they can get these fantastic, soft, airy crumbs from a huge batch of dough. Okay. That's almost impossible for me. Okay. Uh, yeah. But that also matches with my own experiments because when I make <clears throat> just one dough, yeah. then I get it. I, I sometimes manage, uh, I mean, you manage it much more often than I do, but sometimes right. I manage to get a crumb like this. But if I was to, uh, if I had to divide and pre shape, then I always somehow even out the crumb a little bit more. It's never looking exactly the same way as yep. it does for you. I 100% find this find the same thing. I mean, even it's another thing that I learned from foolproof baking. Not to keep talking about her, she's just a great scientist um, and bread baker um, and local Chicago friend. Um, she learned when you're only making a single loaf of dough, you don't even need to pre-shape. So you know the world. <laughs> you read anything you you can about baking. It's always like, well, you take your dough out of the tub and you pre-shape and you bench rest and then you shape. Well. So I, being a baker who follows the rules, always followed that rule. Well, her being a scientist realized 
well, why am I doing this? My bread looks pretty good coming out of the tub. She shaved it up. And so I think some of her breads and some of my breads, actually probably all of my single loaf breads now, I'd say 99% of the time I don't pre-shave. Um, and, and I think you'll get an airier loaf because there's le just less handling. And that same thing that happens with those big batches. And how do you how do you shape your uh, dough? Do you use the same technique of Kristen from Foolproof Baking, where you just sort of roll the dough upwards, or which technique do you like um, to use for shaping? Usually, I kind of two. It, it it sort of all depends. Mostly, I, I fold one flap over and one flap on top, and then roll toward me. I guess yeah, mm -hmm. pretty much like foolproof baking. If the dough seems really kind of slack, if it seems too when I kind of turn it out or I I, I move it around. It seems like to not have enough strength, I guess would be the word. I, I fold up the bottom first to add one more kind of fold or a little bit more structure. And then mm -hmm. I fold the two sides over and then still roll toward me. Okay. And do you then sometimes on the edges of the dough have issues if you just roll it upwards that the edge is not looking yeah. so nice? So, so it seems that that you can, if, if you just... Um, And Kristen would be the one to watch again if you she you you pull the top part of your 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 dough over and kind of just pinch it at the bottom and even though okay. it looks a little funky on the edges like sometimes my edge the right edge for us for worse than the left I don't know why looks really bad and I've okay. never yet ever noticed it in a loaf itself I don't know what I would look for um, mm -hmm. but the you know you see the rolls or the the rolls it's it's just not clean. Um, and Same I think for me, it, it's a lot, whenever I pre-shape, I don't have the problem. So it's a little bit, I think, because the loaf doesn't have the strength that you could get from pre-shaping. Um, okay. yeah, I don't notice it so much in the end bread. Yeah. Well, I mean, if you just look at this picture here, I would say it also looks perfect from the side, right? Yeah. Even, yeah. <laughs> even I'm happy to look at that thinking, boy, is that really me? I mean, it just... <laughs> I just even yesterday I read an interesting thing. If you bring that loaf up, that Chad Robertson said when he was trying to teach somebody at Tartine how to make bread. So he said the key is you want all the different colors because every color has a different flavor. So, oh, so he says when you want really a wise. loaf of bread, he goes, that's one thing you want to look at is how many variations you have from light brown to really kind of crispy. It's funny, I'm I'm pointing, but you guys can't see me pointing. But anyway, from the from the really light color all the way to the very um, edge of the ear where it gets almost charred, where you don't want it too charred, where it tastes burned. But he said all those, all the different colors you get are all different flavors in your loaf of bread or in your crust. There you go so again. True. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful. I think that's a valid point. Okay, and um, if just looking back at this bread, for instance, do you do stretch and folds during your, your bulk fermentation? Um, I do. Okay. I do, I do two different kinds. I, I mm -hmm. keep experimenting. That's the piece that that's the, to me, the, the missing piece for me in bread baking and maybe sort of the critical point, at least as for me as a baker is how do you get that strength in your dough um, and keep it airy? So you, when mm -hmm. I, when I look at, when I look at a pro baker, their dough always looks strong and it looks so puffy and I haven't quite got there. Um, okay. Lately I've been doing, I think that what, The old way was called a stretch and fold where you just take and you lift up and then over and you mm -hmm. do all four sides. And now people do a, a lot of the, what they do, they call the coil folds where you kind of lift up in the middle and the bread kind of, the dough curls down underneath. So, so lately, I think over the last week or two, I've been doing probably two of the really big folds um, mm -hmm. then one to two to three of the small folds. The really, Towards the end and the small folds. So what's that? Towards the end, the bulk fermentation and the small yeah. folds, or once I okay. notice, you know, when when you if you really look at your dough, it starts to really kind of spread out in your container. As it stops spreading out so much, that's when I move to the coil fold. So a little bit okay. less, a little bit less pulling action on the coil, um, just sort of a gentle, more more kind of folding it over to give it structure than to really pull it to to kind of develop the gluten or give it structure. I'm not sure 100 percent what okay. the, the pulling does. Okay, and uh, how late in the process do you do this? Let's say you're shaping. When was the last stretch and fold that you do before, or the last call fold that you do? Um, um, is it like an hour before the shaping? I, or I would definitely never do it? do it 
within an hour. So I'd always try. I mean, I guess every once in a while, if it's just not behaving in the dough, once again, keep spreading out too much. You got to do what you got to do. Um, mm -hmm. But I kind of, I always know if I can keep my, my bread about 75, and now I don't know 75 in Celsius, but 75 Fahrenheit, if I can keep it around there. <laughs> my table, my table it doesn't support this. You've got <laughs> oven temperatures. <laughs> so 75 Fahrenheit, I don't know. I can look at my phone. Um, Let me check. That's, and, the, uh, and then I, I, know, I know my, my fermentation will take about six and a half hours. So then I, okay. I sort of know in my head, between five and five and a half, I want to look at my dough, maybe closer to five. I feel like farther away is better. I would do the last fold knowing that I don't want to do another one unless it just okay. right. Okay, so you are doing it at 24 degrees Celsius. I think <clears throat> the good thing is I last week worked on building my own do-it-yourself proofing box. Yeah. And now I think what I should be doing is I should be doing a recipe from you trying to do exactly your process and then going my results, whether I can also get an amazing bread. Like yeah, this. So, so here's the funny thing about that, though. You, um, your flour is going to be different, right? Your, your mix of whole grain, your, your white flour, your bread flour, the main flour will be different. You'll have different grains maybe that you put in that I put in. It's just our doughs will never be the same. You know, your environment will be different. It just... It's why every baker's bread is their own. I mean, I, I spent years thinking, you know, boy, if that baker did six folds, I've got to do six folds. It really isn't that. It's like, God, like, sure. like I was just saying, if my dough is not spreading out, then I'll do a coil fold. If my dough is still spreading out, I'll do one of those big stretching folds. It's the dough that's got to tell you. It's so, I think it'd be, especially a German flour to an American flour. Um, I mean, I've heard that, 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 you know, if you take, a, a, a bread flour in Chicago and you have the, some baker in New York or California in the U S even using the same flour, it'll still be different because the environment's just different. Yeah. Uh, that's, it, that's the hard part about baking, right? You can never a hundred percent reproduce it. Yeah. It's just, it's different every time. I mean, someone, someone once compared like a crumb to a fingerprint, right? Like every crumb is a hundred percent different. There's no way it'll ever look the same mine from today to tomorrow, mine to yours. It's just, it's true. Yeah. It's, it's growing, right? Yeah. The they're different. They're hungrier. They're not hungry. Your, your starters a, a little bit different, right? Your starter will be a little just different. There's no little big, right? It's just, your starter will be different than mine, which means, our doughs are going to rise differently. Nothing we can yeah. do. Yeah, and I think that's also the hard part about bread baking in general, because you will see a recipe online, and then you're just trying this recipe at home, and then boom, it simply doesn't work at all. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you're lucky and you're nailing this bread once, and then you're thinking, wow, I understand everything now. I know how sourdough baking works. Then you try it a second time, inviting all your friends because you now are going to serve them an amazing sourdough bread. And then it just ends up like a flat frisbee. And then it's, yeah. yeah. I, I know so, nothing. So there's the challenge. It's, it's, you know, a lot of people talk about baker's hand. I talk about baker's mind. Like I, 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 look, at, I look at how people write or how they think. I know my brain doesn't think the way bakers think yet, right? I can, yeah. I like the dog, but it is. It's, it's, understanding what's happening in that particular day to make bread consistent. That's why consistency is so hard. Like when you said, how often do I get a loaf like those ones you were pointing out? And I said 50 to 75%. And I'm sure that's true. Every Maybe every other day or two out of three days, I get a better loaf than a not. Um, but it's just, it's so hard to do it, to, to, to do it even in my own same environment where the temperature of the room, the dough, the starter should be similar, but it's just not. My hands are different. My brain is different. Yeah. It, yeah, that also makes it so challenging, right? That it's always different every time. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I think it's part of the why I love it, right? So it's just there's always more to learn. I think 10 years from now, I think we could have the same conversation and be like, wow, can you believe what's happening to our dough today? <laughs> like, I don't think you're ever going to learn. Like, there's no, there's no, I finally figured it out, right? It just, there's none. Um, one, one of my kids told me recently that Kobe Bryant, for everybody who watches American basketball, he used to shoot three pointers for two hours every day of the week. Wow. Two hours every day. He'd get up, then he'd go home, he'd look at his kids, and then he'd go back and he'd spend two hours doing something else. He'd go home and have dinner with his kids, and then he'd go back. And it just, you know, and he, but he, 
he could always keep getting better. It wasn't after being at the top of his game, he could say, I don't have to practice my three pointers anymore. He'd be like, I got to spend two hours doing it. And you so I think Brad's yeah. kind of the same way. It just, you know, always learning. It's, it, it, and, it's why it's so fun. How much, when you're making a dough right now, how much would you say is you feel the dough, you know the consistency, how much do your hands now know what to do next with the dough? Because I think that's also something that you have to learn and it just takes a couple of breaths to understand. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I, I always feel like I have so much to learn. So I think I'm a little over four years in or four and something like that, not even four and a half. And it's just every day I think I should understand more. It's like, like even now when I say to you, um, I look at the dough and if it seems to be holding together more, not spreading out, then I'll go to a coil fold. I think somehow a year ago, I couldn't have figured that out. I don't know why. It, you, I, I, I think now and I look, I think, well, how come I didn't know this last summer or last winter? I don't know the answer to that. It yeah. just, I don't know. It's just, like I said, I think that's why I'm obsessed because there's just, there's just something more to learn every time. There's something... Every every time I look at the dough, it's different. Um, nah. Just a just a question. Going back to this bread, the flour okay. that you are using for this style of bread, I think this is. Yep. I've seen this bread more frequently recently on your Instagram account. Um, what's the composition of the flour for this type of um, bread that you typically go for? My guess, if it's recently, um, I've started using King Arthur um, organic bread flour which is a mm -hmm. fairly popular bread flour that you can find in grocery stores in the U.S. Um, so mm -hmm. I'd say it's, it, it's um, 80% that, and then I put in 20% of some whole grain that, that I mill myself in the morning. Um, okay. And it's interesting. Okay. So, so getting back to – so I switched over. I even switched my whole grain to – something I would never have understood last year, a, a, a spring wheat. So spring wheats are higher in protein. And for anybody out there, higher in protein soaks up the water a little bit more. I think it makes the dough a little bit easier to handle. I think it mm -hmm. doesn't spread as much. So I, I so I went to King Arthur's flour, which is a higher protein flour than I was used to using. And I switched my whole grain to a higher protein whole grain. And now I think my breads are better. Um, so mm -hmm. I think I, my baker skills aren't good enough to do that with a lower protein flour. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the learning thing again. And so once again, at least for me and maybe anybody who's listening, try a higher protein flour. You may be happier with, with how your bread turns out. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned this because I also recently saw some stock prices for uh, wheat And yeah. the high protein flour is pretty much in demand in the last year, much more than the regular wheat. So people are trying really? to buy high protein flours pretty much. Yeah. Ah, that is so interesting. Yeah. So I always, since I started baking, I used a flour from a, a company in California here in the U.S. called Central Milling. And someone said it's a great flour. Lots of professional bakers, more on the, on the West Coast, um, use it. But it was 11.5% protein. And now I'm forgetting the King Arthur. I think the King Arthur is 13 and a half percent protein. And that's a, okay. that's a, that's a big swing. Um, and, and I'd say my lows are totally different. I was thinking this morning I should go back and try the lower protein flour to see if my, you asked about your hands. Will my hands understand what to do differently when I switch flours? And I can tell you I'm a little bit of afraid, so I probably won't do it yet. Because <laughs> I, <don't think, laughs> I don't think I've learned enough. I feel like I'm getting closer. But I'm afraid because I just I don't want that I don't I don't want to take the cover off and see that shitty piece of the non the bread that doesn't open up so much and so yeah I'm afraid to probably go back but I know I have to to see whether I yeah. learned anything. I was working on a video recently which I did not publish yet and that was just baking with the default flour that you get here in Germany and that's an all-purpose flour with which yep. has around I don't know 11 percent protein maybe yeah see and then. And then I just noticed normally at the current temperatures, uh, which is relatively cold, I can bulk ferment for maybe 10 or 11 hours. I think yeah. it's much, much colder than your environment. Yep. But with that particular flour, I could only maybe bulk ferment for six hours or so. And then when I would touch the dough, it would suddenly get so incredibly sticky. And oh, yeah. I think that's also the high gluten that allows you to ferment for a little bit longer. And then, of course, you can inflate it more and you will get that nicer 
crop. But yeah. I think there's also a limit to it. If you have too much gluten, then your dough at the same time is just sticking together too much and it doesn't like to be inflated. So you need to find the perfect balance between all that, the parameters. <laughs> exactly. That, that's it. It's the perfect balance, right? And, and, and someday you might have to bake with a lower protein than you're used to. Like if I switch, and then the question is, do you, does your brain know what to do? Um, yeah. I watch them there. There's a lot of great bakers um, over in the, the sort of the Asia Pacific region and they're so scientific. And I look at, I, I watch some of their posts and they talk about, you know, these different flowers that they play with. And so they like the challenge. They'll take on a really low protein flower just to see, can I figure out what to do with it? Right. And, and yeah, such a good learning experience. Um, I have one more question, which I forgot to ask you, Jim, and that is, I just wanted to go back real quick <clears throat> to those breads that you made here. And yeah. I think you talked about it before that you don't store them in a plastic bag, but how do you personally store your own breads to keep it good for a longer period of time? So, so what we do here, luckily we eat bread pretty fast here, <laughs> um, probably almost a loaf in a day. Um, so I really, in the morning, I, I cut it in half only because I need the Instagram crumb shot. So I cut in, I take a picture of the crust, I cut it in half and I take a picture of the crumb and we just leave it cut side down on a cutting board. Um, mm -hmm. I'd say it would last, for me, I could eat it too. My, my wife likes it mostly the first day. For me, I could eat it the second or even the third day because I don't mind it if it gets a little stale, like a little of the water seeps out of it. Um, mm -hmm. But but that that's really all we do It's just, yeah. Okay. Cut side down on the counter or really a cutting board. Okay. Yeah. How about you? What do I, you do? I do the same thing and I think that works you, best. If I put it in a plastic bag, the crumb, uh, sorry, not the crumb, but the crust really becomes very soft, right? Yeah. The only thing you can then do is toast it afterwards, I think. You, you, the, the only thing, yeah. So I just, I don't even really like to eat it. It changes so much. It still makes great toast. Um, mm -hmm. And it still make a great sandwich if you don't really like the, to chew that you're in the crispiness of the crust. Um, but yeah, it changes so much. So I, I really like it um, just sitting on the counter. Sometimes I'll put half of it on, in a plastic bag because my wife and kids will eat it out of a plastic bag as, as I'll eat it a little crustier, a little more stale, they'll eat it out of the plastic bag. Yeah. And I was talking to Sune Food Geek before, and he yeah. uh, explained to me and one thing which I didn't think about, but then it was totally obvious. And he said, okay, so the higher you go in terms of hydration, the longer your bread is also going to stay good because you, of course, have more water that can evaporate. So that's, I think, a plus point for going a little bit higher in hydration, maybe 75 or 80 percent, what, what you have been saying before. So I've heard the same thing. I haven't done enough, like I said, since I'm not a good enough baker to really sort of bake an 80 or an 85% hydration. So I don't really know, but I've definitely read that and been told the same thing, that the more water in your bread, it'll last longer on your counter. And Atsavara has just been saying, I always slice and freeze. I think that's also a great idea. I do too. It's, it works perfect. <laughs> yeah. Okay. so. Yeah, I was considering maybe to try, uh, I don't know, a linen bag or something to store the bread in. But what I've been doing so far matches also with what you've been doing, just placing the bread like this and then eating it as fast as possible. That's And yeah. baking new bread every day, I guess. And, and, and the slice and freeze is perfect. So you can really take a slice out of the oven, um, throw it in a toaster, and it'll be as good as new. Um, so, so I do like the, the, the freezing by the slice. I have um, a few questions prepared for you. I'm, I've just been reading through them. I'm really bad at uh, multitasking, by the way. So sometimes my brain just lags a little bit behind. I can't do too many things at the same time. Ah, that's all right. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure I do the same. And um, so I've been asking some of the viewers before to write down some questions. And yep. um, this is a great question by John H. Uh, okay. I'll be putting it here on the screen. So. How can Jim bake breads like that and look like he's training for a triathlon? Please ask him that. I bake, eat, and now I bench press my Challenger pan to keep somewhat fit. <laughs> <laughs> well, if John H is here, my guess is John H is an American. Us Americans, well, no, I wouldn't put us, put me in the category. We think carbs are bad for you. There's nothing, you know, store-bought carbs are bad for you. I think there's, there, 
is sour, fresh baked sourdough bread made out of three ingredients, flour, water, and salt. Like that's it. There is no reason. I've never noticed any health, adverse health effects. If anything, I've, I've got better health effects from well-fermented sourdough bread. I just, John, I think you can eat bread and train for a triathlon 100%. <laughs> so I'm not a triathlete, I can tell you that. Okay. And then Armand, I don't know if you've been uh, experienced and with experienced experienced with this. I was asking, what are your tips and tricks on healthy 100% whole wheat? Have you baked with 100% whole wheat before? I have not. So that is not something that I do. The 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 baker that I follow the most um, if you want to learn about baking with 100% whole wheat with one called Angel in Your Kitchen, her name is mm -hmm. Patrice, but her Instagram handle is the, the Angel in Your Kitchen, maybe. Angel in Your Kitchen or The Angel in the Kitchen. I don't know okay. how I know that. But anyway, a friend of mine for years and years, but she bakes only 100% whole grain breads, and she is super good at it. Um, Ahmed, if you have any questions, I would, I would completely reach out to her. Um, there's a baker called Chris Lem, Chris underscore Lem. I don't remember exactly his handle either. It's funny. Um, he recently just baked his first, I think, 100% whole wheat bread, and it turned out fantastic. Um, so I, I looked to one of those two bakers. Chris is also a fantastic baker who I've known since I got on Instagram. Yeah, I think it's also you learn baking this style of bread here, uh, this one. But yeah. then whole wheat is just like we talked before. It's another category, right? You have yeah. to learn a few things again from scratch. Yep, I think, yeah, every bread is different. I'm, so I'm one of these bakers, almost a little too obsessed. I don't change my recipe very often because I feel like there's, I, I need knowledge. Like I could go to whole wheat, but if I, if I knew a little bit more, I'd be better at whole wheat. So I, I, would, I haven't moved to 100% whole wheat yet, waiting to learn more. I just don't know if I'll ever get there. I hope, it's, I hope it's not something that's always out there in the future. Someday I feel like I know something about bread. But I also, in my own ex experiment, so I was trying to get some uh, some flour from my local farmer nearby, and I was also milling it myself. And I thought, okay, well, now I'm going to bake an amazing whole wheat bread with that flour. And yeah. It simply didn't work. And the problem is that at least where I live in Germany, we don't have so much sun. And in order for flour or for grain to build a lot of protein, you need to have a lot of sun. Yeah. And so the flour that I can get from my local farmer, it's local but it doesn't have enough protein, enough gluten to get that nice structure. So right, right. you have to exactly. find a flour as well yeah, that just supports, if you want to have that nice oven spring and bunny shape, of course. If, you, yeah. if you're fine with a sandwich bread, you can just toss it into a loaf pan, of course, and be done with it. Right, right, right. And I, and I think 100% whole wheat will never be quite as lofty or as airy and holy as a, a bread made with um, red flour, white flour. Yeah. Flour. I've always been auto leasing for quite a long time. And for my whole wheat recipe, I actually noticed after a few attempts and a lot of fails that the auto lease wasn't necessarily helping the whole ah, process. Interesting. See, there you so, go. So you need the knowledge, right? So maybe that's it. So maybe, you know, the auto lease is sort of developing the gluten. Maybe you don't need it with the whole wheat. And I think the it's also now it's winter time. So my main fermentation is always taking around 10 hours, but it might be a completely different story in summer when my bulk fermentation is just taking six hours. Maybe I need that auto lease. Again. Yeah, right. that's interesting. Yeah, someone someone just commented on one of my posts the other day that, that if you ferment for, like I was fermenting, he saw six hours. He said, Jim, I talked to a baker scientist who said you don't need an auto lease. I find it, I told him I found it hard to believe and I'm a little afraid of the experiment, but he said he thinks it would turn out, like Chad Robertson's not, he's not a big auto leaser, um, but it's just, it, and once again, there's a million ways to bake and you, you sort of get stuck in your way and sometimes it's a little hard to, to get yourself off center and to, to make yourself do something different. Like all wheat, 100% all wheat for sure would be different. Like yeah, I think it just it also just depends on your environment and your setup again. There is not just one rule to rule them all pretty much. Right. Uh, yeah, you need to adjust depending on your temperature, your flour and everything. And like that, <laughs> even the type of whole wheat you have, like so the, the local one that you got is just different. Um, I know if you look, you can ask these bigger mills for a list of specs. And this, this baker, Greg Wade, who's now our, our sort of brand ambassador of bakes in Chicago and is a James Beard Award winner, 
So he showed me the specs. And so there's all these things. And so when he's at a bakery, you know, he's got to turn out hundreds of maybe thousands of loaves daily, weekly. And so every single batch of dough he gets, he looks at all 10 variables, some being more important than others. So he knows, oh, I need to, because of this variable, and this is way out of my league, you know, I'm going to add more water now. I'm going to tell my bakers to add more water. I'm going to tell them to okay. ferment a little longer because, you know, as they get a whole nother bag of flour, they can't have the bread go bad for a day or two. They need it to be okay. exactly the same. So once again, the challenge from a bakery point of view is even far bigger than it is for, for us home bakers to keep that loaf the same. And that's probably also when the large mills need to adjust the flour by changing some proteins and things like that mm -hmm. inside just so that they have consistent flour every year pretty much, right? And then it's no yeah. longer that organic as it used to be. So, so yeah, so, so, so you take the, the bigger mills, their flour becomes blends from several different farmers in order to, to keep it, to keep the protein level within a certain zone. And I'm sure there's a few other main variables that they look at that we home bakers don't look at as much that Greg Wade as a professional baker looked at and tried to explain to me, but there's a lot of variables that these mills look at to try to get a consistent bag of flour to us, you know, consumers. Yeah. I, I visited a mill last year really? and it was also very interesting because I, I have my own small mill at home as well. And I thought, okay, yeah. maybe I can just use it to make the perfect flour. But then Monica, she's the owner of one of the largest mills here in Germany, a small, well, an organic mill pretty much. Nice. She explained to me, Hendrik, it's very important that throughout the milling process that you don't increase the temperature that much. Yeah. So you want to make sure that you have multiple milling processes, but you don't want to yeah, cause any heat or something on the flour. That could actually have negative impacts. But on how your flour will bake. Yeah, I've heard the same thing. Um, I keep all my grain in the freezer mostly for that reason. So if, if it's starting out you know, ah, at zero, then there's less chance it's going to get to that whatever. I, I, I read once what that number is, the temperature where you just – you'll start having adverse effects in your flour. But if you keep your flour, your grains in your freezer, at least at least if you're not milling a lot, like especially enough for a loaf or two, you're not going to heat your flour up too much at home. Mm, that's an amazing idea, Jim. I never thought about that. <laughs> it, 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 it helps. You died, I, I, I got but someone put the fear in me of don't heat up your grain too much. I don't remember where, but so you hear it once. But yeah, put put your grain in the freezer. You'll be happy for it. Awesome. Okay, then I have another question coming here from... Uh, I'm not able to pronounce your name. I think it's Gregor. Let's keep it at Gregor. Gregor Sivek, I'm sorry. <laughs> or Sivek. <coughs> Can we ask, why is the Challenger so much more expensive than a Lodge, for instance? Um, you know, it's a good... It, it, it's a tough question. I can answer the question two ways. Um, the challenge is more expensive because we're, we're making it with local artisans in the United States um, so that the pan is poured by, by artisans you know, in Wisconsin about two hours from me, and then they're, they're seasoned in another company that's a couple hours south of me, um, and, and the labor and the iron itself is just more expensive. We could make the pan in China for a lot cheaper. Um, it's something that we keep considering. I, I hear things that the U.S. cast iron is better. I don't know. I'm still a small company, so we haven't experimented. It's a it's a big undertaking to ask somebody, let's say, in China to make our pan and start doing experiments. So I haven't been able to do it. Um, but Lodge is a, is a very – is an anomaly to me because they make most of their cast iron also in the United States. They actually own the manufacturer, something that I obviously don't have. Um, mm -hmm. but I don't know, I don't have a good answer if it's Gregor's, um, I don't have a good answer how Lodge can do it so well. Um, any of the other pans that you see, there's a lot of other cast iron that you could buy for, you know, $49 or $50 US. I can guarantee you 99% of those will have been made in China, but Lodge has been able to produce a, a good quality pan at a, at a low price. Um, I wish I could do it. <laughs> I would be the first one in line if I could make my pan for half the price. And it, I really, when when we when I first started out, it was it it cost less, and and I was losing my shirt. I invested a lot of hours and a lot of money um, in the pan, and so I had to raise the price of the pan. All I'm trying to do is 
figure out the price where I can have a sustainable business. I can get this pan to bakers around the world. Um, and, 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 you know, it's, it's like a guessing game, you know, you don't really know. Um, but yeah, you I would, I would lowered, love to do it. You also lowered the price recently a little bit, as far as I know. You did. Right? Yep. Yeah. So I, I looked at some other cast iron Dutch ovens. And I thought I should put the price around those, but you know, just for, for home bread bakers, it was just too expensive. And so we tried it for about six months or something and and it just we were selling pans it was doing well but too many people were just telling us it was too expensive so then we lowered it down to here and it seemed to have got kind of a sweet spot um that, that i think i can build that sustainable business and that bakers seem to mostly be happy mm. that that it's not too expensive but it it is still you know if you if you're gonna have a passion whether it's bicycle riding or, or anything you know you're gonna you're going to have to buy equipment and it, 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 it's a little bit more expensive than something else, but, but it'll help you bake better bread and it's worth it. You put all that time in all that hours and hours of work to, to bake in an inferior manner, you know, that, that $225 us for that final step after all those hours you put in it, it it's, it's worth it. And, and, and I'm, I'm not here making a ton of money that I can tell you a hundred percent. The reason why I got my Challenger bread pan back then was that I thought, okay, if I fail at making bread, then I want the reason to be myself. I don't yeah. want the reason to be my equipment, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, so, so there you know the end. I mean, I can tell you. So, I baked on the, uh, a, a, a pizza steel for for probably I don't know a couple of years. Or I broke my 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 actual oven three times and the, the, the guy who repaired it told me the last time um, he had to bend because of the steam pans that were sitting in the bottom of my oven, it bent the bottom of my oven. He took a two by four and did it. He said, Jim, this it, it, we, I will not be able to do this again. You've got to stop. Uh, <laughs> it was probably part of it. Three times I broke my home oven trying to add steam to it. Um, okay. It is just, it's not worth it. Yeah, I agree. And then there was another question from um, Georgios. I think we talked about it a little bit before. Uh, how's the Challenger bread pan different from a steam oven? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. I've only, I've never had a chance to bake in some of those newer steam ovens. Um, I've read a lot about them. I almost put one in when when um, we built our new home um, because I wanted to experiment with it from cooking and a baking perspective. I talked to one baker, I think, I've only talked to one baker who seemed to be successful with a steam oven. Um, so Giorgio's, I'm not sure yet. I would, I would love to see, I haven't even seen a lot of people baking bread, even the modernist bread guys. I think the books are back here, you know, five volumes and they didn't do a lot of baking in a steam oven. I don't know why they didn't try it. So my mom recently got a new oven around two years yeah. ago, and she invested the money in a steam oven. I still have to experiment with it a little yeah. bit more, but it sounds like a dream come true, right? The steam oven, but it's still uh, one of the problems is that it might be too hot inside of your steam oven. So from my own experiments, really? you have to place another tray on top of your dough just to shield it a little bit from that high heat coming from the top. Oh. So it's, you still need to do a few hacks. And then I'm thinking, okay, maybe it's better to use a bread pan or a Dutch oven. Ah, and then that, you just made me realize, so in a professional deck oven, like the small one I have, but any one that any professional bakery has, there is, you know, basically a, a button or a setting that you can press that vents all the steam out of the oven the same way we take the lid off to get rid of all the steam in a Dutch oven. So if so, that's a really good point. Um, if a steam oven can't get rid of that steam at 20 minutes if, with, with completely and saying no more steam bake in a normal oven, you're not going to get great bread. I had yeah. never thought about that. That's really, really a good point. So I still need to experiment a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I'll follow along. I would love to see you experiment in here with that. <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah Jim. Yeah. It's been one hour and fifteen minutes already. This it feels yeah. like five minutes. It's been great. <laughs> well, <laughs> we've been talking about doing this for so long. You know, as we said before, everybody got online. You know, it's, he was going to come visit in Chicago, and that hasn't happened. But Hendrik, I know, I know you'll be here. And now I got to. You know, we, we, we've emailed back and forth and now we get a little, you know, 
talking, talking with a bunch of other bakers, which is always fun. It was great. Yeah, it was great. I think we should do this again in a year or so and see what we have learned. Or maybe we are so frustrated that we gave up on sourdough baking. <laughs> well, I, I can guarantee without in the Instagram community, I would have given up on sourdough baking years ago. So you need the support of everybody. Really, without Instagram, I would 100% not be a baker today. So yes, I would love to talk in a year. I'm sure we'll know a little bit more than we know now, and there'll still be there'll still be a hundred things that we don't understand yet yeah maybe we, it's just gonna be like that we know we feel like we know even less than we know right now in a yeah. year from now <laughs> I, I i think the more we learn i think the more we'll think there is to learn uh, yeah i yeah. think that's actually a, a true statement yeah so true yeah 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 I, okay then yeah please everybody make sure to check out uh jim's instagram as well jim chell the founder of the challenger bread pan it's been breadware sorry it's been such a pleasure talking with you jim this has really been amazing and yeah, thanks hendrik this has been great it was it was well, as i just said great to meet you and it's been a great talking to you i don't know i don't know how long we were supposed to talk but it's been an hour and 15 minutes that went super fast so it was super fun and it was awesome Loved it. So thanks, everybody, for uh, joining in. Yeah. Also, thank you for sending the questions in advance. Uh, thank you so much. And yeah, see you soon, everybody. Thank you. See you soon.